The winners of the Friends of the Falun Gong Poetry Competition has been announced. If you don't recall me talking about this competition in my first episode with Evan Mantic, its purpose is to raise awareness about the ongoing persecution of people who follow the Falun Gong meditative practice, a persecution committed by the Chinese government. And the first place winner of the competition is... Susan Jarvis Bryant! Our dear Susan Jarvis Bryant, whom I just interviewed in our last episode. She has garnered yet another feather in her cap for her poem, Tooth and Claw. Now, if you haven't heard of this competition, then you are probably like most people. But just because it doesn't have the same name recognition as the Pulitzer doesn't mean it isn't worthy. There's this assumption that if you haven't heard of somebody or something, then they must not be any good. They deserve to be obscure, whereas if someone gets famous, then they must be good because they're famous. That is, fame and obscurity justify talent and talentlessness, respectively. But that assumption presupposes we are living in a society of healthy institutions that are carrying out their normal functions. In this case, to recognize and reward excellence, when that is simply no longer the case. American society is in an advanced stage of institutional decay. Its arts organizations have betrayed the original purpose for which they have been created. That's why we have to establish parallel organizations and alternative awards that will carry out these functions. And the Friends of the Falun Gong is one such award. I'll be exploring this topic and more today on Classical Poets Live. Welcome to Classical Poets Live, the only podcast where a poem is just a poem, not a revolutionary manifesto. I'm your host, Andrew Benson Brown member of the Society of Classical Poets, the world's largest organization devoted to formal poetry. We can be reached at classicalpoets.org. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, and leave a comment at the bottom. Our second episode got a number of comments. DPTrack1 says, I'm new to poetry and very much enjoy classical poetry. Until recently, I believed that if poetry didn't rhyme and have meter, it wasn't called poetry. To my surprise, I found that just about any writing that an author wanted to call poetry was poetry. Under that reality, my sister is a great ballerina and my dog is an impressive painter. Thank you, ABB, for this podcast. Well, thank you, DP Track one for watching. Best of luck to your dog's artistic career. I'm sure that in no time, it will... <clears throat> I'm sure that... In no time, his work will rank in quality with the worst of Jackson Pollock's drip paintings. I'm also proud to say that I have received my very first dislike. Yes, someone gave me a thumbs down for my second episode, so more of that on the way, I'm sure. But some great news, or maybe possibly good news. According to podstatus.com, Classical Poets Live is ranked number 147 in the United Kingdom in the category of book-related podcasts. Uh, this refers to Apple podcast stats, not Spotify or YouTube. So, is that good? Um, I actually, I actually don't know, but I'll take it. I know that there are a little over 3 million active podcasts out there. Not sure what proportion of those are book-related. I'm guessing kind of a lot. So... Not a bad start, I think. Now, there has been some concern expressed over the content of my second episode. I was kind of aggressive in labeling certain poets as fake poets, notably Allen Ginsberg and the most recent Pulitzer winner, Carl Phillips, uh, but mostly just Allen Ginsberg. And the concern was that I shouldn't be referring to other poets as fake because it might offend some people, might alienate some people who might otherwise be sympathetic towards classical poetry. Now, one thing I realized I didn't do was that I'm talking about fake poets, but I didn't actually offer up a definition of what fake poetry is in contrast to real poetry. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time explaining my reasoning here and just more generally why I'm doing this and why I think it's needed today because it's filling a gap that no one in the poetry world is willing to to talk about. Now, 
I agree that we need to mostly focus on the positive, and we're going to have a lot of positive examples of great poets and good poetry on this show, but we need to talk about what we're up against here. Now, as far as calling poets fake and being not nice, if this were five years ago, I would agree with those criticisms. There is this idea that if you just put in the hard work and write a lot of great poetry, create great art, that that's enough, that it may take time, but the world will eventually notice your work. Now, I think that's true of most times and places, and you know, in the long run, certainly, but we are not living in most times and places. We're just no longer living in a world where the good gets recognized. As I noted, arts organizations are no longer bastions of tradition. They're in the process of actively deconstructing themselves. They are very corrupt. They've been captured by elite Marxist interests. Not only are they not going to notice you if you're good, if you're a classical poet, if you're really you know doing anything traditional, they are actively trying to destroy what's good. They are burying the good and canceling artists who don't tow their radical line. Now, in a little bit here, I'm going to be interviewing a poet named James Sale. He is the author of the epic poem, The English Cantos, the greatest living epic poet in the world today, in my uh, kind of humble opinion. And chances are, if you're listening to this, you've never heard of him. Now, why is that? Why would you have not heard of the greatest living epic poet in the world today? Well, publishers only care about you if you're a celebrity, and if you're not already well-known. It's very hard to become well-known, basically impossible. On top of this, the publishing industry is woke from top to bottom. If you don't fall in line with their agenda, they don't want to have anything to do with you. The fact of the matter is that the entire Western canon is being dismantled. Uh, Virgil and Homer have been removed from curricula, made optional in classics departments. People are graduating with classics degrees who don't actually know anything about literary history, about their own field. They are altering the very process of canonization by not promoting anything that's good. They're just elevating social justice literature, even though the average person doesn't agree with them, doesn't accept their choices. Um, probably the top canonical poet today, I would say, among this crowd is Maya Angelou. She has been really lionized by the left, and she's the one person that they're able to agree on. Most of their canon is just a revolving door of authors who win awards and are quickly buried as they move on to promote the next intersectional identity. Now, this dismantling is not confined to literature. I was reading an article just about a week ago about the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The Met is apparently just giving away all its art. They are hiring a team of experts led by a, quote, manager of provenance to conduct investigations into antiquities objects that are suspected of being unethically sourced, they say. And if they find that this is the case. They return those objects to their country of origin. The Met has returned many works to Egypt, Greece, Italy, Nepal, Nigeria, Turkey. And uh, just last month, a number of works returned to India. Now, I'm not saying that it's good when your art is unethically sourced, you know, being Napoleon ransacking Egypt, carrying back all the artifacts to France to start the Louvre, right? That's how the Louvre got started. That's probably, honestly, how most museums began. But I feel like these guilt trips and ethical inquiries are just the tip of the iceberg, and soon you're going to be saying to yourself, hey, let's take a family trip to the art museum, and you're going to arrive and it's just going to be a bunch of empty rooms because they just gave all their art away. I have been reading a new book by Heather MacDonald called When Race Trumps Merit, and it's about how generally wokeness is destroying society, but she devotes a significant portion of the book to the topic of the arts and how what is called disparate impact analysis is sweeping across arts organizations. If you say art should just be about art, or that there are objective aesthetic standards that exist, you will be accused of being racist. And all European art forms are now presumptively racist. She specifically talks about classical music and how diversity quotas are destroying the standards of orchestras and opera companies because people from hip-hop cultures just don't undertake training in the classical tradition. They just aren't interested in it. I haven't finished the book yet, uh, so I don't know if she goes into poetry. It seems doubtful, but the poetry world has been deeply affected by this too. In my first episode, I talked with Evan Mantic about the founding of the Society of Classical Poets, and I mentioned the Poetry Foundation. I wanted to go into a little bit more detail about this, because it's just 
very instructive of where we are today. Um, their publication, Poetry Magazine, is one of the most prestigious poetry publications. They are the biggest poetry organization today because 20 years ago, a philanthropist gave them $200 million. And now that they've been captured by woke interests, now they're a $200 million Marxist organization, which is totally paradoxical, but there it is. So in 2020, when rioting was going on around the country, the Poetry Foundation released a short four-sentence statement where they denounced systemic racism, like so many other you know, organizations and companies did. When they did this, a lot of people got angry. They felt insulted because it wasn't enough. They were merely insufficient in their enthusiasm. So the president, Henry Beenan, and board chairman Willard Bunn III resigned. Uh, which, by the way, I just have to point this out. If your name is Willard Bunn III, is anyone going to think that you're not the most elitist, privileged white person who's ever lived? I mean, come on. Nobody was ever going to be convinced by your vague statement of solidarity, but they capitulated like everybody else. And so Beenan and Bunn were replaced. Uh, their new president is this diversity bureaucrat. And then they released a strategic three-year plan that is this very long, rambling document about how they are taking the opportunity to address the foundation's past and current positioning and how their principles reflect diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and commitment to anti-racism in all forms. And when you look in detail at what this strategic plan entails, uh, if you're watching this video, you can see this diagram that's in the shape of an hourglass or a double inverted pyramid, whatever you call this. If you can't see this, this process involves phases such as environmental scan and contextual analysis, internal assessment, conference and audience participation survey, external assessment, strategic planning retreat, action planning, etc. I'm not going to read them all, you get the point. Basically, this has nothing to do with poetry at all. The Poetry Foundation is no longer an arts organization, it's just an anti-racist organization. Arts organizations are not defending civilization. It is now the barbarians who are in charge of them, and they are running these organizations into the ground. So the Met will soon be just a building full of empty rooms, and opera houses will be theaters with empty seats, because nobody is going to go see a bunch of underqualified diversity performers who can't sing or play, many of whom actually, this is true, they don't even practice their instruments because they know they have job security and they can never be fired. And the Poetry Foundation is just doing environmental scan and contextual analysis instead of sponsoring poetry. So, to return to my point about exactly what is fake poetry, how do you define it? Let me start by telling you what isn't fake poetry. So I'm not claiming that a poet is fake just because they write free verse. In my last episode, I mentioned a contemporary poet who was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, Jay Hopler. I read one of his poems. I said that I think he's a good poet. He's attuned to the craft of language like E.E. E. Cummings or Wallace Stevens. But he's also a person who writes formal poetry and he knows what he's doing. A lot of his free verse is kind of formal-ish. It exhibits elements of structure. Now, Vladimir Nabokov, one of the greatest prose writers in the English language, he was of the opinion that there was actually no meaningful distinction between poetry and prose. Now, if that were true, he never would have written his novel Pale Fire. He actually said a lot of opinions in his lectures on literature, which he contradicted in his own literary practice. In Pale Fire, the first half is a poem, and the second half is a commentary on the poem written by a scholar who misinterprets the poem in a funny, insane way. Obviously, there is a meaningful distinction between the first and second half of this novel, so Nabokov is basically wrong, but he is right in the sense that a piece of prose can be described as poetical, by which we mean it exhibits a high degree of craft. It's very beautiful, it's lyrical. So prose and poetry, different categories, but prose can be poetical, and likewise, poetry can be prosaical, it can be very mundane. Now, most bad poetry that is written, it is the case that I happen to disagree with the writer's politics, like everybody at the Poetry Foundation, for example. But I'm also not claiming that a poet is fake just because I disagree with their politics. 
Percy Bysshe Shelley, romantic poet, a classic example. He held very radical views. He was an atheist. He was an anarchist. He was one of the most radical people on earth in the 19th century. But whatever you say about him, he was a radical in a time when it meant something to be a radical. He even got kicked out of Oxford for his views. Today, you don't suffer for being a radical. You don't get kicked out of Oxford for your views. Being a radical is what gets you into Oxford. It's what gets you a full scholarship. In fact, being conservative, that'll get you kicked out or at least alienated within the Oxford culture. But you know, the main reason we still read Shelley today is because he was just a great poet. I mean, who cares about what his politics were? The problem is, is that the contemporary Marxist freeverse people, they're not great poets. They're not even good. And so let me offer, if I could, an analogy about fake poetry and just the poetry business today, or the po biz, as it's called. So imagine that you go to the state fair to witness the annual pie competition. Uh, admittedly, nobody really does this anymore, but let's just pretend for a second that we're living in Rogers and Hammerstein's America. So you're heading to the state fair and you're really excited about the pie competition, and you're thinking, huh. Man, I wonder what pie is going to win this year. I bet it's going to be so succulent and juicy with fresh fruit straight from the vine. And the dough is going to be just so crisp. And my mouth is watering just thinking about it. And so you get there and you're watching. And then the blue ribbon goes to a pan of empty crust. Like this person just bought the pre-made pan of crust at Walmart or something and submitted that to the competition. And it's not just the winner, it's actually every contender who submitted a crust platter. And the judges are people without taste buds who have never bit into an apple or experienced the taste of real fruit. They actually hate the idea of fruit, and they have barred pies with fruit from being considered in the contest. And that is just what poetry competitions today are like. The Pulitzer, the pushcart, everything that wins is just pans of crust. So why do I call these people fake poets? Well, it's because that's what they are. Just platters of crust. They're actually not poetical in any way at all, whether you define what they're doing, what they're writing as poetry, or just as dull, lopsided prose. It stinks. With a few exceptions, I mentioned the Friends of the Falun Gong poetry competition. It's one of the few poetry competitions out there where the entries are not empty platters of crust. It is a classical poetry competition. And as I had mentioned in my intro, Susan Jarvis Bryant won first place for her poem, Tooth and Claw. She is no doubt spending that $500 cash reward as we speak. Who knows what she's splurging on? Uh, perhaps it will be Help out to her dear friend, Andrew Benson Brown. I got a real whopper of an electric bill this month. If you're listening, Susan, it's simply not fair that poets should have to pay for such mundane things like electricity and groceries and things like that. So I'm eagerly awaiting the patron who will swoop in and save me from the struggles of existence. And who knows, if someone wants to donate $200 million to me, then we could rival the Poetry Foundation. Until then, let's focus on Bryant's winning poem, Tooth and a Claw. Now, this is a pantoum, which is a form that actually originated in Malaysia, of all places. And it was Victor Hugo in the 19th century who introduced the form to Europe. The pantoum is a poem composed of four line stanzas in which the second and fourth line of each stanza serve as the first and third lines of the next stanza. And the first and last lines are usually the same. So here it is. Tooth and Claw. Observe the tooth and claw of savage deed. Beware the ferric breath of looming dread. Don't let the taunt of terror sow its seed. The heartless reap a harvest seeping red. Beware the ferric breath of looming dread on ill winds wafting from a shady shore. The heartless reap a harvest seeping red. The truth is leaking neath the dragon's door. On ill winds wafting from a shady shore, ghosts whisper of the fate of Falun Gong. The truth is leaking neath the dragon's door, to ring from every bold and golden tongue. 
Ghosts whisper of the fate of Falun Gong and pleas that rise in prayers for those in pain, to ring from every bold and golden tongue, to tell of horror's fierce and hellish reign. In pleas that rise in prayers for those in pain, let's speak for brave hearts robbed of song and sound. Let's tell of horror's fierce and hellish reign. Let's stand for meek souls beaten to the ground. Let's speak for brave hearts robbed of song and sound. Don't let the taunt of terror sow its seed. Let's stand for meek souls beaten to the ground. Observe the tooth and claw of savage deed. An excellent poem. Tooth and Claw, of course, alludes to Tennyson's phrase, Nature Red and Tooth and Claw, from his poem In Memoriam. Uh, Tennyson was referring to the brutality of nature, and it's interesting how Bryant adapts this reference to the brutality of social organization in the symbol of the dragon, that a repressive government can be just as nasty and brutish as a Hobbesian state of nature. Now, the other winners and honorable mentions, all quite good poems too. Unfortunately, I don't have time to read them here, but if you're interested, you can go to fofg.org. should say that I think Susan Jarvis Bryant put it very nicely when I interviewed her in the last episode, just regarding everything I've been talking about here, that a poet needs to be fearless. And in our times, that means having the courage to denounce these people, whether it's the authoritarian Chinese government or it's the proto-authoritarian American government and all its woke institutions. They are not only wrong, but they're dangerous and evil as well. Their ideology needs to be opposed. We have simply reached the point where we can't sit on the fence anymore. We can't afford to be nice. We can't worry we're going to be offending somebody because you always offend somebody. Western civilization is teetering on the brink of collapse. This is a war, and we are fighting for everything we ever had. Football games are won by offensive strategies, not defensive strategies. And I know it's strange to think of poetry and art as a warfare. Um, in a sane world, we wouldn't have to get political. But as Andrew Breitbart said, politics exists downstream from culture, and we have to fight for that culture. And part of fighting back is setting up and promoting arts organizations that offer an alternative to the mainstream narrative which is just to say, arts organizations that represent what everybody believed about art like five years ago. Just an arts organization that is normal, that has normal ideas about the reality of truth, beauty, and goodness. These things are not relative, they're not socially constructive. Just because you call something ugly beautiful, so you can be trendy, that it doesn't make it so. And the social justice movement is, at bottom, deeply nihilistic, it doesn't rest on any firm foundation. So, be fearless. Have the courage to say a poem is just a poem, not a document of oppression. It is a vehicle for moral values, hopefully, but ultimately just a good piece of writing that will give readers a tingle of delight and instruct them on something symbolic or historical. It's very naive to think that a poem is going to change the world in any kind of direct way. And as far as good poetry, you know, I sometimes have people say to me, I like reading formal poetry, but I don't understand how you can write it. It just seems so hard. Well, if you are someone who has the ambition to write great poetry, but you don't know where to begin, then you need to subscribe to James Sale's Poetry Circle. Every month he sends out a newsletter via email that contains useful tips for how to improve your poetry. It is free. And I am going to share with you his very first tip, and that is, you need to write bad poetry. Ah, you weren't expecting that, were you? Yes, the first step towards writing great poetry is to write lots of bad poetry. And more important, looking at your poetry with a critical eye and recognizing that it's bad. If you can identify the worst line you've written and give three examples why it's bad, then you're on your way to becoming a great poet. Everybody begins in mediocrity, even Shakespeare. His first plays weren't really all that great. If you're interested in learning more, then you need to subscribe to James Sale's Poetry Circle. You can go to his website, The English Cantos, at englishcantos.home.blog, and click on the articles section, and it's right there at the top.
Okay, now speaking of James Sale, it's time to talk with the man himself. James has had over 50 books published, most recently Mapping Motivation for Top Performing Teams. That was published by Rutledge in 2021. He has been nominated by the Hong Kong Review for the 2022 Pushcart Prize for Poetry, has won first prize in the Society of Classical Poets 2017 annual competition, and has performed in New York in 2019. He's a regular contributor to the Epic Times, and his most recent poetry collection is Stairwell. Welcome, James Sale, England's leading epic poet. How are you? Thank you very much for inviting me, Andrew. I'm very well indeed, and it's a real pleasure to be here with you and talking to your audience. It's absolutely great, and I know we're going to have a good time. I'm sure we will. Now, uh, James, I refer to you as England's leading epic poet, of course, probably your England's leading lyric poet as well. Now, there's a nasty rumor going around, James. I don't know if you've heard this. Uh, they're saying that a lot of people say that England's leading epic poet is this guy named Simon Armitage. I don't know if you've heard of this person. He's UK's <laughs> poet lawyer. So that's a very prestigious position. People argue about how far it goes back, but I'd take it back as far as Ben Johnson, Shakespeare's friend. Under right, the right. Of, uh, King James the First, he he was given sacks of uh, Malmsey or Port or something or other, in, in in order to reward him for his wonderful contributions to the masks and poems he wrote for King James the First and subsequently Charles the First. So I I count him as the first poet laureate. And if you go back the three hundred and four hundred years of poet laureateship, what you find is you have some absolutely incredible poets who've been poet laureates, Ben Johnson being one of them. And of course, particularly in the 18th century, you have got a whole host of poets one, no one has never heard of because they were so awful. So uh, Shadwell, Pye, and these sort of people that were pretty awful poets. So it's been a very mixed bag. And it's been a mixed bag in the 20th century as well. I mean, at the end of the 19th century, we had Tennyson was poet laureate. And um, one cannot deny that Tennyson was a very, very fine poet indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, going into the 20th century, it's been slightly different. There's been a kind of, I think it's become slightly more political than it has actually. <clears throat> it's always been political, but it's kind of got, it got even more so. Yeah. Uh, the thing changed at the end of the, of the 20th century. We, we had Andrew Motion, or Sir Andrew Motion as he is, who I think is at the John Hopkins University in Baltimore now as a professor of literature. But it changed under his sort of tenure when it was originally a poet laureateship for life but under his tenure, it became a 10-year, a decade term. So we get every 10 years a new UK laureate. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, whether it was still whether it was still a lifetime position. I think we need to bring that no. back personally. You know, over in America, it's just like one year. It's just a one-year tenure. It's not even 10 years. It's, just, it's even worse over here. And you got to get like re-elected, so to speak, which rarely happens. Yeah. Well, you know, it's very interesting you should say that because I think being a one year tenure for such an important position is, is I, I personally regard that as ludicrous. Of course, it's very democratic because everyone gets a turn, but I don't mm -hmm. think poetry is about everybody getting a turn. I was very disappointed when this was reduced from lifetime to 10 years, because if you take it on for if you actually take it on for a lifetime, what you're saying is I'm really committed to this. And we've had um, some people in the 20th century who were really good. John Macefield, for example, was poetry. Mm -hmm, yeah. was really committed to it i feel as if it's like oh here's my latest job this fits on my cv hey i'll do this hang on i'm off to america now to a university there and take up another post it's like a series of cv moves rather than the muse is inspiring me and here i am for mm. more on what i really think of poet laureateship in the uk people might like to read canto 10 of my hell ward where oh, yes uk appear in person in hell so do read that i think you'll find it very interesting and and for those american listeners and viewers of your podcast there are two very very famous american poets who also appear in my hell ward in canto 10 i have to say in case you haven't guessed it to be in hell ward is not good <laughs> it's a bad place to be but read on <clears throat> yes, thank you, uh, James. Of course, in the sane world, uh, James Sale would be the poet laureate of England, in my opinion, because it has had such a checkered history in recent years. And we wonder, is it ever going to get back on the right path? They're going to name a classical poet the poet laureate again. I don't know. It so, seems very unlikely. Uh, what we need to enable that to happen, and, and to be quite frank, I mean, I personally don't aspire to be the poet laureate, partly because one has to write poems to order. 
So mm. this is actually... Oh, right. Um, uh, Sir Andrew Motion himself only very recently says he regrets every single day now that he ever <laughs> wrote poems for royalty. So having taken on the task, he now regrets having wrote the poems he was required to write for royalty that he wrote. Uh, I wouldn't want to write those poems myself anyway, so I, I wouldn't be aspiring to it all. But I would want the poet laureate uh, for example, a really good poet laureate in the 20th century was Sir John Betjeman, who wrote mm. many mm, yeah. memorable classic poems. And he he also served a really good social function. I mean, people knew him, they liked his poetry, and um, he was frank and, and he had this classical background. But what I would want to see is that kind of thing again. But the trouble is, one would need a complete cultural shift for that to occur. That cultural shift does not seem to be on the horizon in the UK or in the USA any time in the near future. But it's what I think this podcast is aspiring to. It's what the Society mm. of Classical Poets is aspiring to. It's what other uh, publications are aspiring to, is to get um, culture and civilization back to basics, back to real value, real morals, and real kind of achievement. Mm. I was thinking about this the other day. You know, in the Middle Ages, there was... There was the Pope, and then there was the anti-Pope. You know, you had the enemies of the Pope who they're siding with the Holy Roman Emperor, and we're like, "Hey, Pope, yo, you stink. We're gonna set up our own Pope, and he's gonna be the real Pope." I feel like yes. maybe that's what we might do with the poet laureate position. We could create the anti laureate, who would of course be the real laureate and the regular yes. laureate. You know, they're the fake laureate. <laughs> yes, and I think that's a bad idea. Actually, if you give them the name, but it have to be slightly different from the UK poet laureate. It have to be the, the something something UK poet laureate. But yes, it's a good idea to create the anti-pope to the current popes in order to have um, a completely different kind of feel for poetry. The thing is, what you have to remember is in 1913, a poet you've never heard of called John Oxenham mm. had a publication called Bees of Amber, a collection of verse called Bees of Amber. I think it, within five years or so, it went through 27 editions. It sold hundreds of thousands of copies. Nobody's heard of him now. But the idea that you have a collection out and it sells hundreds of thousands of copies, unless you are a political person with a TikTok kind of profile, you have 8 million followers, mm. it's just ludicrous. Um, and so something has happened in the 100 years which has stopped people buying poetry. One of the things that's happened is it's become far too intellectual, far too false, mm -hmm. far too eccentric, and it's not fun anymore. It's not Fun. I note that your last guest, uh, Susan Jarvis Bryant, writes poems which are actually fun. Mm -hmm. Some of them are extremely funny indeed, and they're about things which we all know about and want to talk about. So in a sense, um, that should be selling hundreds of thousands of copies. The chances of it doing so, of course, are small because the audience for poetry has dissipated. All we really need is for this podcast to get a couple, you know, million followers, and then everyone will be buying your poetry. <laughs> we're working, of on course. It. Yeah, we're working, working on it. Yes. If you're listening to this, pass it on to somebody else, and say, "Get James Sales' book, Stairwell. You won't regret mm. it." Now, um, regarding your professional life, now you're a, of course, a feature writer for the Epic Times. You've been writing for them for uh, a number of years. Five right? years, maybe five years. Five years. Um, there's a couple of guys who both write for the Epic Times. Uh, just take a few moments to maybe say a few appreciative things about them. Because, you know, to my knowledge, they're the only conservative media group that even really has an arts and culture section, right? Yes. Um, it's, it's New York-based, but it's international. It, I think it has a, a readership of over a million readers. Um, mm. It's full of great reporting. It's full of intriguing insights and stories. Uh, but I think the thing we particularly like is it's committed to the humanities and the arts. And mm. I said I've been with them for five years. I think I've done over 80 major article pieces for them. But my focus is on mythology, literature, some religious and some philosophical themes too. And I'm interested in making the invisible visible in a funny sort of way without specifically referring to the epoch times i mean that's what good reporting does isn't it good thing mm. Einstein and kind of people is that you know what was really going on with nixon in those days those reporters back then was that things were going on invisibly and the reporters politically made what was really going on visible and i like this idea of making the invisible visible robert bresson once said make visible what without you might never have been seen what without you might never have been seen. So mm. when we talk about, for example, as I do uh, Greek mythology, 
we know these stories and there's Oedipus and there's Odysseus and there's Heracles and there are these people and there's a great story. We like them, they're action-packed stories. But often their spiritual and psychological significance is hidden or invisible. So what I like to do and what I have been doing with the Epoch Times and what the Epoch Times have generously allowed me to do is to make such meanings visible and explicit. And of course, in saying this, this is exactly what poetry does. All good poetry is making something visible that wasn't apparent before. And that could even be, I don't mean just heavy meanings, I'm talking about sound effects and onomatopoeia and the metic stuff that goes on. It's just wonderful how this stimulates us when we write it and when we read it. I did enjoy your most recent piece, a two-part series on the, uh, what was it, a morality, politics, and decline, where you wrote yeah. about how morality and evil are being replaced by the discipline of psychiatry with its notions of victimhood, which really undermines our notions of freedom of the will. Yes. And uh, now this is something you have some particular insight into because you're a motivational expert, right? Your company, Motivational Maps, uh, yes. focuses on organizational psychology and helping businesses improve their performance. How do you deal with this victimhood issue in your professional life? Do you do you advise companies on this topic or do you just kind of steer clear of it or what? <laughs> well, huh. the, the, the best thing is usually to steer clear of the politics of this. Right. But of course, on the ground, how can we help people? How can we help people? How can we help people is, is of paramount importance. Now, you mentioned I have a motivational company. I do, just to be clear about what this is. It's a company called Motivational Maps. You can mm. find it at motivationalmaps.com. But what essentially it does mm. is it provides a diagnostic which measures um, and defines what motivates you as a person in, from nine possible categories. And it has a series of reward strategies which help people become more motivated. When they become more motivated, they become more energized. When they become more energized, actually, one of the things that, that does, well, two things it does, it one, it boosts their self-esteem. And secondly, it actually frees them up. The thing about motivate, high levels of motivation is it's like an immunity to things like, I say like, so I don't to be taken too literally, but like mm -hmm. depression. You know, when you're highly motivated, when you're fully engaged with something, you're not depressed. You're not. You're you're likely to have less mental disorders. So, in an indirect sense, I am not going into companies and saying I can help you solve depression and I can help you solve your victimhood problem and I can help you solve microaggressions. What I am saying is, let's focus on the positive. You know, there's a range of people working in these companies. They've all got various issues. Some are highly motivated already. Some are not highly motivated. In fact, at a certain level, we do say, in fact, we've reached the point where um, we're not dealing with motivation at all. We are dealing with things that need psychotherapeutic interventions. Hmm. We don't do with what we call the wants of people. What do I want? Healthy people want things. People who are psychologically compromised need things. And there is a world of difference when you come to deal with people who need things. You find they're not motivated, but they are doing things that they need to do. And frequently this need to do things actually spills over into what I would call the either the amoral or the immoral because they're not too concerned about the consequences for the people around them. They need this. They need this money. They need this food. They need this recognition, this status. They need control. And they're prepared when the need gets too strong to do anything for it, which is quite different from saying, I want, I want status. I, I want to make a, a, a living. I want to be a successful person and make money. I want, I want, I, I want learning and expertise. I want to be innovative. That's quite different from I need I need. So there's a point at which our diagnostic registers that mm, this person probably can't be helped with our interventions. It needs a deeper level of intervention. And that, of course, is when you get into the victimhood kind of situation and also what I would call the game playing. You know, you, we've all met people, sometimes they're even in our own family, who keep playing games. They, they can't speak the truth about themselves, about other people. And they do these repetitive behaviors, which are designed to usually irritate the people around them. And they don't learn. 
They don't pick up the cues. So it's a complicated, it's a, it's a profound issue, and I certainly don't claim to have all the answers, but we have over 1,200 management consultants and coaches in 16 countries who use our product, and we've had fabulous reviews from the people who use it. So we know we are onto something in our way. Mm -hmm. Now, you've been writing poetry for over 50 years now. Seven. How, 57 years. 57 actually. years. How did that begin? How did you get into that? <laughs> I think I got into it in the same way that many, but not all, of your viewers and listeners got into it. So um, I, when I reached the age of 13, my voice dropped, I grew facial hair, and I suddenly lost interest in board games and became interested in girls. And that's it. I, I mean, I didn't see it at the time, but basically I hit puberty and suddenly I started writing poetry. And so there's, there's this crossover. To impress the girls, was it to impress the girls? Well, James, I to, think there's a, to get a date. Connection, which Yates would, would totally agree with, and I think Shakespeare would agree with it as well. And, and actually, Dante would agree with it as well. Strong connection between um, sexuality and the creativity of mm. poetry. And now, that's not for everybody, and I'm not going to stereotype this because I don't want right. to go into you know, tropes of the, it's a bit like the trope of the, of the excessive artist, you know, the drugs and the drink and oh, you've got to be dr taking drugs and drink to be creative. No. Oh, you've got to be a sex maniac to be a poet. No. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying though is the normal function of the body and the sexual awakening. It's like leaving the garden of Eden in a way, the innocence of it all behind mm -hmm. you. Suddenly things in life become more complex. And I know, and retrospectively, I realized I started writing po very bad poetry very bad but it was the best that i could do then and i've never stopped writing since so it will be really great andrew if you could validate me and say that i'm writing better poetry now than i did when i was 13. well i would certainly hope so after 57 years uh, yeah. yes well, i've been practicing a long time i've been studying and practicing a long time mm. So that's how I got into it. Puberty drove me into it. There are other causal factors, but it will take too long to go into all that. I think that's a key thing we perhaps many of your listeners and viewers can identify with. But, you know, when did they suddenly start finding themselves wanting to write stuff, write stuff? Mm. Did that coincide with puberty or some other major event in their life, which was really kind of emotional? I think the emotional side of this, the sexual emotional side of it is really important. Mm. So for most of your career, you're writing lyric poetry. Then you graduated more recently to epic narrative, yeah. right? Which is which is the standard way to do it, right? I mean, that's what Virgil, Dante, uh, that's what Milton did. Now, of course, I did the opposite. Uh, I just kind of jumped right into it, which, in retrospect, maybe was rather ill conceived. I don't know. I know more about poetry now than I did three years ago. But you took the standard approach, which seems to be the correct approach. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, well, I think, you know, here's the thing. I think um, I actually tried in my 20s to write a Miltonic epic. Mm. And um, I didn't get very far with it. And the reason I didn't get very far with it was it was a reason I discovered other people had discovered it. Keats had discovered it. Keats, actually, yeah. Himself, yeah, with his Hyperion fragments. Actually, you cannot write in blank verse epic without eventually becoming totally Miltonic. Mm. Um what was perplexing me, so I've always wanted to, so once I encountered Epic, once I encountered Milton and Spencer and Dante in my 20s, I encountered them all in my 20s, I thought, you know, uh, I want to write something like this. I really want to write. I've always had this desire to do it. So it's not like it was a revelation when I started writing my Epic. I couldn't really find out how to do it. And because Milton was the model in English, it was only when he suddenly dawned on me that Dante was the model I should use because... I could use his model without sounding like Dante because his was syllabic based, ours mm. was straight based. Right. So I kind of like realized, and also because the Terzarema form had incredible narrative propulsion, which I just simply hadn't twigged when I'd read it in my 20s. Mm. Uh, and so this was an absolute revelation. So I suddenly, my dream of what I wanted to do suddenly came true because I had the form in which I could do it without reverting to being 
uh, Dante. And right. there's no possibility, of course, in this form of being Milton either. Yes, and uh, oh, of course, you mentioned Terza Rima. I think you're the you're the first poet to successfully use this form in English. Well, I think Shelley had his unfinished poem, uh, his unfinished yes, epic, Triumph of Life. life. Yes. Uh, but as far as things that would be completed, um, you are the first to do this after you know so many hundreds of years. I think I'm the no. first to do it in epic form. I think there are some yeah. American poets who've actually had some successful Terza Rima lyrics, but in oh, terms right. of epic. I think I am the first to do this as in the English language. So, yes, I think that is, I think that is true. So let's talk about your epic a little bit. The English Cantos, as it's known as a whole, or your latest uh, stairwell. Now, I myself recently wrote a book review of Stairwell, uh, published on so the Epic much. Times. Really of course, that. published on the Epic Times website. So if anybody listening, you can go there and read it. But Glenn Young, the ubiquitous Glenn Young, who reviews everything, has now reviewed your epic and he's a very insightful reviewer this is what he said about his review of stairwell on uh, tweet speak poetry his dot com which is his blog um he says stairwell is every bit as good as its predecessor hellward it's almost staggering to see what sale is accomplishing here a contemporary epic shaped by dante but fully its own work the story is engaging and often riveting the commentary on culture is sharp and insightful you will never read anything quite like it, except perhaps the epic that inspired it. Now, James, I have to ask, uh, you know, as far as your whole project here, what's going on? I mean, does anybody care about epic poetry? Should anyone care? Should we just throw all this stuff in the trash to make way for the latest iPhone update here? What is your take on this? (laughs) Well, the take on it is actually Glenn Young in that review also said something else that was very interesting, which was, a uh, strangely um, chime with one of the reviewers on Amazon um, back for Hellward, because he said this was the only book of collection of poetry he'd been looking forward to as a sequel. Uh, he said, because most poetry, you, you know, p- poets have a collection, then they have another collection. And it's very cerebral and you're not thinking to yourself, I want the next collection, but he wanted to know what happened next. Now, weirdly, somebody on Hellward reviewing it said that one of the most really most almost preposterous and ridiculous things about the collection, but of which I am most proud. They said, well, I don't read a lot of books and I came across this and I and I read it, but really it was just like my favourite author, Jack Reacher. It was like a Jack Lee Childs. It was like a Jack Reacher novel. Now, I mean, you, you, if you read a Jack Reacher novel, you will know my book, my, my book is, is, but what they meant was, and what um, Glenn Young meant was the narrative is so powerful, you're compelled to read on. You think, well, this is a highbrow poem, it won't interest me. Oh, it's in this very highfalutin language, it won't interest me. It's in this terzarima, it won't interest me. But it's what I'm most proud of is the story. The story, which is full of the fabulous and the awesome and the wonderful and actually the almost unbelievable. And you read this as you might do some sort of fantasy novel where one fantasy after another, it comes up and each one, I think, I'd like to think anyway, is unexpected. So the book's nothing like a Jack Reacher novel, but in a sense in which, you you know, you know if, you, if you read a Jack Reacher novel or if you watch Tom Cruise as Jack Reacher, you know, it is pretty compelling. You have to watch it because it just drives on. This story drives on and it drives on at the moment from Hellward's finish, that is hell, to match Dante's inferno then we've done purgatory which is called stairwell so we've finished the purgatory and currently i have nearly finished canto three of doorway which mm. is paradiso which is where we go into the heaven part and can i just say about this it's about the genius of dante i, I was on a course once many years ago and the woman running it was talking about dante i mean she was a psychotherapist and she said you know um you know dante's model of the the hell purgatory and heaven it matches really it matches as if she approved of it it matches jung's thinking in the early 20th century about the human mind and psychology i, I had to put my hand up like a child to say excuse me don't you think jung is matching Dante. I think Dante came first by about 650 years, and she wryly grinned at me and agreed. But what it comes down to is this, is that it's not just a spiritual poem by a Catholic. It's a psychological poem that applies to everybody. So people in hell are people who are completely unself-aware. 
They have no self-awareness at all. They are completely self and ego obsessed and they cannot change. And they're not in hell really because God wants them to be in hell. I mean, God's cruel and capricious and who can believe in God like that? It's because they want to be in hell. That's where they want to be and that's where they are. So they've got what they want. Now, the people in purgatory are different. They have developed a self-awareness so they know they've done bad things. They know that they've gone off the rails and, you know, made mistakes and they want to do something about it, but they haven't yet fully fulfilled that doing something about it. So they're in, hmm. they're in a limbo state. And then finally in purgatory, what you've got is not perfect people in paradise, rather, not perfect people. What you've got are people who self-aware, they know they've sinned, they know they've done bad stuff, and they've integrated their faults into their personality to redeem it all. Now, that is to a spiritual power, clearly, but they have accepted the spiritual power, and that has enabled even their faults to make them authentic, whole, coherent, flexible, changeable, community-based, loving-based. And so it's a completely different kind of person who's in the paradise to who's in the hell. And each person has chosen to be there themselves. So this is a very, very profound model of the human mind. And that's why it appealed to me so much in writing my own three-tier poem. Mm. Yes, it certainly doesn't sound anything like Jack Reacher, though I can't speak from experience <laughs> myself. I haven't seen any of those. I've seen other Tom Cruise movies, so I can imagine what oh, you're talking about. Those, but there's two. There. See the first one. <clears throat> first one. The second's mm. not so good. But the first Tom Cruise Jack Reacher film, despite all the criticisms about his height, the first one is really awesome. It just mm. it hooks you. It doesn't let you go. It, the narrative is just brilliant. I strongly recommend it. I'll I have to it. check that out. Yeah, but I do feel what you're saying about the you know how the narrative pushes you along, how you want to read more. Uh, and I agree with Glenn Young that uh, you know looking forward to the next installment of the poetry, unlike so much of the you know boring stuff that you encounter in academic poetry today, which is just awful. But yeah, yeah. what's it about? Um, what's it about? What's it about? But as far as uh, Dante, do you have any other? Do you have any particular passages mm -hmm. that have spoken to you more than others? You, you did say to me you'd like me to speak about Dante, so I did mm. sort of get my little Dante collection out. Mm. And I, I, I'd like to read four lines. Okay. And uh, after I've read the four lines, I'd like in, in Italian, and then I'd like to read them in English, a translation mm. in English, and I'd like to recommend a, a really brilliant translation, uh, a new translation that's only recently come out from an American called J. Simon Harris. Mm. But before I do that, I'd just like to read this. And just to give a quick context for it, this is actually Canto Five of the Inferno. It's one of the most famous cantos in the whole of the Divine Comedy mm. poem. And it's Francesca and Paolo. And they are two lovers. Mm. And this all in the circle of the lust, whole, yes. Yes. Troubadour tradition, chivalry, King Arthur, King Guinevere, the adultery of Guinevere with Lancelot is alluded to in this. Mm -hmm. And it's a terrible situation. And you feel for them. And Dante feels for their situation because, of course, she's having an affair with her husband's brother and he brutally murders both of them before either of them have an opportunity to repent from this sin of adultery. So they are in hell. But the situation is dire. And the and the actual um, canto ends with these four lines. It ends, Mentre che l'uno sbiato questo di se l'altro piangea, si che di piatara, io veni men così come io morisse, e cadi come copo morto cade. Just read that last line again. E cadi come copo morto cade. What's this all mean? Mm. Well, what it means is J. Simon Harris, Dante's Inferno. Great book. Uh, great translation. The last four lines mean, while the one spirit spoke, that is Francesca, the other wept, that is Paolo, so that from pity then my senses all grew faint as if I were approaching death, and then I fell as a dead body falls. Now, in English, you can hear, can't you, the drama in that last line. I mean, the, the sheer overwhelm of the emotion, and mm. then fell as a dead body falls. But if we look at the Italian, you get exactly the same, only more so. E 
cadi como corpo morto cade. It's actually an iambic. In fact, Italian isn't in iambic. It's not a stress space, but this is actually perfect iambic pentameter with a hypermetric syllable at the very end. So 11 syllables. There's 11 syllables in the line. But look at that cade piatade rhyme. Cade come corpo. Cade, the alliteration, the corpo morto. Corpo morto, the assonantal vowel sound. E cade come corpo morto. Cade, the kind of emphatic falling down. Even in the Italian, if you don't, you know, if you're not, if you're not, you don't speak Italian, you can hear the absolute power of that language and the emphaticness of it all. And he just, like a dead body, just collapses. I mean, the whole of Dante is so visual. In fact, videre, to see, after to be and to have, after the verbs to be and to have, is the most common verb that's used in the whole of the poem. To see, to see, to see. He's always mm. seeing stuff. This is an incredibly visual poem. And I'm trying to make my own version of this visual as well. Mm. That was oh. always one of my favorite cantos. I'm kind of curious about the brother there. What happened to him? I mean, you'd think he'd end up in the murderer's circle. Does well, Dante mention no, him no. again? or does yeah, mention him. And in fact, what it mentions, if I can just find it, let me just see if I can find it. Oh, here it is. She says, love led the two of us to a single death. Cana awaits the one who deprived us of life. And that is a genius line. Mm. Cana, the land of Cain, the land mm. of Cain and Abel, Cana, the land of Cain awaits the one. It's so understated. She doesn't start raging, oh, that B, that effing blah, 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 he did this, it was so unfair. It's just suddenly the one who did this, Cana. And Cana, of course, is a lower depth in hell. It's where the mm. ice is. It's mm. where Satan is. It's, it's actually where the traitors are. Oh. He awaits the one who deprived us of life. So there's this incredible foreboding. So here we get in the stand, in, we're in Canto 5, there are 34 in the Inferno, 34. So now we know that lower down, so the lust near the top, uh, a lesser sin. And as we get lower, we're going where the murderers and the traitors are. I do like that Italian, it does flow off the tongue. I like to, I do like to read translations that have the dual text and just look at the you know, look at the original language and see how it oh, flows. And too. often, yeah, you know, and too. often, you know, when you're reading a bad free verse translation or something that's overly literal, you can, again, notice how it really doesn't capture the spirit of the original no, at all. It's one the problem spirit. I have. I strongly recommend mm. this. J. Simon yes. Harris, who is a classical poet. <clears throat> uh, that, that's a thick volume there. There's a lot of footnotes in that volume. Yes, loads of great like, notes yes. as well. Yes, J. Simon Harris doesn't deprive you. The only other version that gives you such great notes is the Dorothy L. Sayers version. Mm -hmm. I do like that fabulous, version, yes. Fabulous notes. Dorothy L. Sayers version actually gives you great notes as well, but mm -hmm. that is another take on it. It's really good. Now, the Sayers uh, translation was kind of an inspiration for you, wasn't yes. it, in your own, yes. in your method, especially your, your rhyming method. I think I read the Sayers translation kind of shortly before I actually encountered your own work, auspiciously, I guess you might yes. say. Yes. I noticed your, yes. I think your dedication to it was taken from something that she said about it. Yes, actually. Was it about an, if an Englishman were to write? Here it comes. It's the actual, one of the three epigraphs. I have three epigraphs per book. Mm. So there's nine epigraphs in total. It's a magic number for me. So the epigraph from Dorothy says, let us suppose that an Englishman were to write a contemporary divine comedy on Dante's model. But mm. This was one of the key texts I read that inspired. I thought, yeah, what a good idea that is. What a good idea that is. And can you see, I mean, one of the important implications of it about reading generally, since most people don't read anymore, but what, is that you know, we get our ideas from reading. If, we don't, if I hadn't read that, would I have actually carried off what I've carried off? It inspired me. And you're, I know you're inspired by so many writers. I'm inspired. So mm. many people on the Society of Classical Poets website are inspired by other writers. It's, it's the right thing to be. If all we're going to do is rely upon our own intelligence and inspiration to write stuff, it's going to be very thin gruel, mm. very thin fare. It's going to be very lacking in substance. We actually need other people to actually develop a real richness and texture and 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 and, and, and genius if mm -hmm. we want to be genius we have to have and acknowledge other people are geniuses because we're relying on their work to help our work
Mm, yeah, I mean, that's the paradox of originality, right? I mean, true originality yes. is based on okay. models, right? You're basing yourself on models and you're not just making stuff up, which is when we get to the you know, contemporary age, that's just what everybody's doing. And it stinks. It's terrible. I talk about this a lot when I talk about your work, the richness of the language, the the syntax, and then, of course, the uh, your unique rhyming structure. Um, would you care to give uh, our listeners a flavor of your work by reading a passage? from uh, well, your epic i would love to do that thank you for asking me i'm just going to say the context i'll start with canto one the ascent because hmm. if i read something dramatic later on it's uh, it's kind of not so much in context so you need to understand that i have just escaped from book one hell hmm. ward from hell but i've reached a blockage and one of the great gods apollo who in fact is really the cherubim uriel who, if you've read Paradise Lost, you will know is the god of the sun in Paradise Lost, which is why right. he's Apollo in the Greek mythology. He arrives to help us break through the blockage that is presented, pre preventing us from ascending into purgatory. And he creates 10 steps upwards by the power of his arrow. And as this is going on, and these steps are appearing, the, stem, the 10 steps that take us to the top of purgatory, which we have to climb, um, a remarkable healing scene is also happening and transforming Virgil. Now, Dante has accompanied me in um, hell, but now as we it go to purgatory, Dante is accompanying me, but also Virgil is joining him. Only this time, unlike when he accompanied Dante in the Divine Comedy, and he was just a shade going upwards who then again down, he is now, for reasons which are given in the text, he has been surprisingly redeemed. And as he begins the ascent to the top of purgatory, his body is beginning to regenerate, like Eurydice's regenerated, as Orpheus led her from hell and she was almost fully formed as they reached the sunlight, and mm. then he looked back. So this is the kind of image that we're trying to get to. So a brief extract. But greater wonders still awaited yet, for Uriel's arrow had struck deeper far than anything I could imagine. Guess, ten cracks of rock produced, each their stone bar extruding, thus becoming level steps that to the summit proved an even stair before us only one cubit to leap where we could leave behind profoundest hell ascend and not look back at that dark deep how virgil studied his own hand scanned well noticing every tremor of his blood pulsing with life and its resurgent swell. Such his surprise at being done such good, in fascination stayed as cobras do, when punji players sway and fix their mood. Oblivious to our nearby rescue, so Virgil studied his reforming arm. I shouted, Lord, step up, we're nearly through. Though one past death, might scarcely notice harm, suddenly Virgil acted with mastery. He too had life, and with it, life's alarm. Grabbing my collar, his first thought for me, he whisked us up in one instant ascension, where standing upright ahead, we could see. What seemed a step was one massive extension, domain where frail spirits worked out their work, to find the truth beyond failed earthly visions. I stood amazed. I'd surfaced like a cork, and as I did, I gulped the air, relieved to be beyond the sufferings of the dark. In great company there with Virgil. Like how he acts very decisively there. Virgil and Dante guiding you, two greats. I like what Glenn Young said. He noted about the, you know, how it's really Dante a lot of the time who's kind of helping you guys along, who's the superior spiritual authority when yes. you and Virgil are kind of cowering in fear. <laughs> yes. It was a very perceptive observation. And the thing about it is he has to be, because one, he's actually in heaven, come from heaven, whereas Virgil has never been there yet. Mm. And two, because, of course, in my opinion, he is the greater poet. In fact, yeah. I regard the Divine Comedy as probably... 
I mean, I regard Shakespeare as the equal to Dante, mm. uh, but in terms of one single poem, mm -hmm. the Divine Comedy is probably the greatest poem that we've ever know written. That's yeah, ever. right. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd agree with that. You could say, you know, Shakespeare's collected works are maybe, yeah. you know, at, at the top, but yeah, as far as one single work, it is, you know, Dante's. It's so original. Nothing really came before it. Virgil, yes. reading Virgil is a lot like reading Homer, you know, but Dante, totally original. Yes. Great model for you to aspire to. Well, he's a great model for, for everyone who wants to go down mm -hmm. that line. You know, this is the thing about the classic Shakespeare, you know, Dante, Milton. There they are for all. My son was very, Joseph, Joseph Sale has really been inspired in his great poem, Virtue's End, with Spencer's epic, The Fairy Queen. And it, it is an astonishing uh, continuation of the poem. You know, these great models are there. And if we just keep thinking we're going to invent our own new stuff all the time, I mean, it's so it's so thin, as I say, it's so paltry. <laughs> you know, we want to use these models mm. to create real poetry. Well, it's very arrogant, arrogant to think that you could do it better than they could. Yeah. Um, yeah. I fully accept Dante's poem is, is much, much better than my poem. I'm, I'm, I'm in his shadow. But the fact is, I'm in his shadow. And that in itself says something. Yeah, I feel that way about, you know, Byron and previous mock epics that have been written uh, compared to my own. Yes. But I yeah. guess that's just the age we're living in. <clears throat> um, we do the best we can. We do the best we yeah. can, yes. Do you have any advice that you would give to aspiring poets, the rising generation? Uh, so if it's, say, three yes. pieces of advice. Okay, yes. Well, the first piece of advice I'd give the rising generation is, one, read my short monthly poetry newsletter it's free and the first 12 editions will all contain one piece of advice at least on how to write great poetry so mm -hmm. subscribing to that newsletter is a really good thing for you to do because i'm giving some advice which i think is really profound i strongly recommend you you, you get into that that newsletter and uh, you'll mm -hmm. see you know, regular drip drip of advice is really useful secondly find a poetry role model someone you aspire to be like living or dead and start the serious process process of imitating him or her. You know, imitate, 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 you know, till it gets out of you. You know, there was a time when I was sounding like W.B. Yeats because Yeats was a huge influence on me. I was sounding like Hopkins because Hopkins was a huge, Jeremy Hopkins, huge influence on me. So these, you have to kind of get into their work till you get out of their work and you find your own voice, but it's not an easy thing to do, but that is what you need to do. Find the role model. And the third piece of advice, which I think I'd give you, I think is really, really important and overlooked these days is practice, practice, practice writing in iambic meter. 90% of all great poetry in the English language is written in this meter. And there are powerful reasons why. If you take my newsletter, you'll find out what those reasons are. But actual fact, all the great poetry, more or less, is written in iambic. So only a fool would ignore it. And the corollary of that advice is avoid free verse like the plague. <laughs> avoid free verse like the plague. Because if you know, one of the things about free verse you'll notice is nobody can quote it. So that's a really a bad thing because we want poets to quote. And two, Nobody can differentiate one person's writing from another. It, it, it's amorphous because there's no shape. Remember, what we want with poetry is beauty. And what is the characteristic of all beauty? It's form. The characteristic of all beauty is form. So if you're actually going to say, oh, well, I don't have a form. I'm just writing free, whatever comes to me. <laughs> you know, try building a house like that and making it beautiful. You just can't do it. So. Avoid it like the plague. Avoid it until you become as good as T.S. Eliot or as knowledgeable as Eliot. I am, I'm not a huge Eliot fan, but he did produce some good stuff. But be fair, mm. he spent a long time getting to the point where he could abandon the iambic. Mm, yeah, and the best free verse poets, they were steeped in the traditions and they didn't know what they were doing. Yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, I think Wallace Stevens is kind of the same thing. Okay, those are great pieces of advice. Thank you. And now, um, as far as your own... Um, projects and goals. I'm sure you have many of them. Uh, what does the future hold for you? Beside, obviously, you have to finish your epic poem. That's number one priority. 
What yeah. happens after that? What happens after your epic's done? I mean, how long have you been working on it now? Six years, seven? Well, six decades? years, seven years. I, I, I reckon mm -hmm. eight or nine, well, perhaps nine's the magic number. Nine might do it. But um, what, what the future holds for me, I could sum up quite quickly. What the future holds for me, I'm 71 this year, is extreme old age and extraordinary <laughs> vitality. So, <sighs> you know, hopefully, hopefully, extreme old age is going to be mine, extreme old age, and to extraordinary vitality and i wanted to be such that people will say when they see me gosh he actually believes the scriptures those who wait on the lord shall renew their strength mm -hmm. they shall rise up with eagles wings isaiah chapter 40. Hmm, i believe it so that the big picture the smaller picture is I was delighted to tell you that uh, my wife and I have just had a grandchild by my son, Joseph. Oh, so she's five yes. weeks old, Isabel Marie Sale. So that's going to be great. The sale line are. continues. You've deferred the extinction of your line for another generation. Congratulations. Yes. Well, I, I need have to have an elder son as well, actually, who's got three, three daughters. Oh, okay. Well, you're doing, all, you're doing well then. <laughs> I've got four good granddaughters. Job. That's good. Um, the maps you've mentioned operates in 16 countries. So there's a lot of work involved with that. I need to keep going with that because I love it so much. And I think more, more specifically, we have next month, um, a fortnight's exhibition of poetry stairwell and four artists at a lovely country house at Upton Park uh, near Poole. And we are putting on all this stuff. Uh, I've got my friend, Professor Antonino Queriamonte, who's going to do some soundscapes for part of my poem. Plus the artists have all been inspired by the poem. So this is something really, really exciting. And it's made me think that one of the ways of promoting my work is this whole thing four artists have already come forward to to be inspired by it i'd like to get a lot more artists and composers too who feel that this kind of work with its narrative with its scenes with its imagery with all that it's providing could be a source of inspiration for other people mm, and that yeah. would be good. I'd love to go to america new york even or maybe yes. kansas and have an exhibition on where, uh, where there's uh, canto, some artwork, and some fellow poets and artists are there performing with me, and we, we'd have a great time. I hey, hope to see you here, uh, yes. I... My friend um, from Grand, Grand Junction, um, you know, Michael Petrack and his legacy poem, The Great Fable Legacy. <laughs> well, what a, what, a, what, a, what a ball we'd have if we were all together doing something. I hope to see the day, yes. Well, you have a lot of a lot of projects on the horizon. I'm glad you're staying busy. So many people, you quit your job and you retire, and then it's just uh, you fall into a kind of despair because you have nothing to do. I've never been busier, really, and I'm 71 or 71 this year. And, you know, there's so many exciting things to do. And it's, it comes back to that dream my son had when he said, you know, your father's died, but he, he hasn't finished his work yet. I've, and actually, one thing I didn't say, you've reminded me, actually, which is a really good thing to say about this, you see. So the, the point about the poetry is... It's a vacation. Just as I talked about the um, the, the, the poet laureate's 10 years and then mm -hmm. they're, they're giving it up. It's on their CV onto the next thing. No, no, poetry is a vacation. If you're just doing this to for some um, some sort of functional uh, reason that, you know, it would be a nice thing to be a poet or, you know, I just want to be famous as a poet, you know, it's not going to work. You have to be called to do the work you're doing. And it's not just poetry that calls you to do work. I mean, I've got this business side to my life and it's very important. People depend on me. I'm doing stuff, which I think is important. So the idea that I'd retire seems far-fetched and fanciful. What would I retire to do? Sit around, drink coffee, sit around, have cups of tea, sit around and read the newspaper, watch television. Actually, a little bit of television is nice. A little bit of newspaper is nice. A little bit of coffee is nice. Some t I particularly like tea. Russian caravan tea. I shouldn't use the word Russian here, but I like, do like Russian caravan tea a lot. But, you know, there are things we have to, to do to fulfill the purpose, the mission of our lives. That's how I feel about that. So mm -hmm. I'm not retiring anytime soon. Well, glad to hear it. Do you have any any closing comments, James? Any last bit of wisdom before we sign off? No, I would just like to appeal to all your viewers to say to them, look, if you think classical poetry is important, if you think this is something that is transformational and this is something that society needs to be more involved with and culturally more involved with, please take hold of Andrew's. It's not about me, but to take hold of Andrew's podcast, 
get your friends to subscribe to it, pass it round, talk about it on social media, tweet it, go on about it on Facebook or wherever you, Instagram, wherever you operate. It's important we get the word out. There's some real good quality stuff going on here, not just my stuff, but other people's as well. And we need to promote it. So I think this is really important and I'm really impressed by how Andrew's going about this and what he's doing. And, um, you know, it's small things, small things. If you keep doing them, you keep doing small things, you end up finding you make a huge impact. Hmm. So um, think about it in terms of your loved one, your partner. You can make the big grand gesture and then forget all about them and they hate you for it. But if on a daily basis you do small things, small things, you're always remembering them and you do them, over a period of time, real love begins to blossom. So we want you to love classical poetry. We want you to enable it to blossom. You, the viewer, are the person who can really make this happen. Thank you for that endorsement, James. I appreciate it. Well, it's been great talking to you, James. Thank you so much for being on and sharing your wisdom. We'll have to have you on again sometime when when Doorway gets published. You'll have to come back. <laughs> well, or maybe exactly. maybe sooner if I get if I get bored, if I'm lacking and people to talk to. Then... There'll be loads of people well... wanting to come on this and tell you that. The question is getting the right people with the right messages. And and actually the other thing to say this, I mean, of course, is that poetry according to Sir Philip Sidney, is to um, delight and instruct. Mm. And so I'm very much into this delight thing with the poetry that, you know, read it. It's the Jack Reacher effect. It's the Tom Cruise effect. You read the poem, it really drives you forward. It's delightful. But of course, it also instructs. And we want people who can instruct others, who can give them pointers, ways of going forward. Actually, one thing we didn't mention about Stairwell is actually there's a huge load of notes at the back. This was by demand, actually. I wasn't going to include notes, but people said, oh, can you include notes about some of the more passages which need some further elucidation? So there's a whole series of notes there, you know, because they help instruct people as opposed to delight people on some of the pointers or the illusions that I'm actually making. So we want these people. We want loads more of it. Footnotes are my favorite part of the book, well, aside from the book itself, which uh, <laughs> you know, it, it elevates the work to a level of intellectual seriousness that it wouldn't otherwise have. Yes. But glad those are in there. All right, James, I thank you. Okay, I thank, thank you, you for being much. on. Okay, that was James Sale. And when I return in two weeks' time, I will be interviewing another James, James Tweedy, another award-winning poet who's done a lot of innovative things with classical poetry. So until that time, you are on your own. You'll have to cuddle up with Shakespeare in bed, perhaps. Recite Dante over and over to yourself to maintain your sanity. And if you survive, I'll see you in two weeks. Thank you.